the Central Committee members uh, that are gathered here and the NEC members to say how grateful we are uh, to be here. And earlier on, we open our session uh, with Matthew 25, verse 18 following. And uh, that Matthew and Jesus listed a number of pathologies and a litany of ills, uh, reminding us that our God was vulnerable and our God was in the hands of all of us as human beings when we don't clothe the naked, when we don't visit the imprisoned, when we don't give water to the thirsty, when we don't give food uh, to the hungry. I reiterated that in South Africa we can add uh, to that litany uh, corruption in some places, maladministration, impunity, and uh, just the lack of the willingness uh, to make all of God's people to encounter God's abundant life. And so it, we are very proud that Professor Pile is going to help us uh, frame how our voice in such a context can be clear and not mumbled, how our voice can speak truth to power, and how we can be reminded that we're not a big NGO, but we are a church, and we get our mandate from scripture, and we reason, and we wrestle, and then we go into the, the mission field. And so with those uh, brief words, we just want to thank you as the South African Council of Churches uh, for this partnership and uh, for this collaboration. And we look forward to hearing you, uh, Professor uh, uh, Jerry. And um, we want to reiterate again another gospel imperative that we are reminded that our neighbors are not only those that are around us, but our neighbors are far and near. And let's spare a thought for the many people throughout uh, our continent in particular where there is still war and conflict, and particularly the people in Sudan. They are not in the headlines, but the Middle East and Palestine are in the headlines. But there is internal fighting in Sudan, and almost the same number of people that have been killed in the Holy Land have been killed in Sudan. Let's pray for all those places where there are coups uh, in, in the continent. But not only pray, as we said in our liturgy when we opened, let's commit to action. As the Kairos document points at us, we cannot just speak from the rooftops and not commit to action. So I thank you. Thank you very much, Archbishop. We are now wanting to give an opportunity to uh, Father Lawrence Ndrovu just to speak to us about uh, Fortosa uh, Foundation and maybe just something brief about him. Uh, Father Lawrence Nduduzi Ndrovu is a dynamic Soweto-born Catholic priest and serves as administrator of the Cathedral of Christ the King and the executive director of the Fortosa Foundation. His multifaceted roles extend to poetry, he's a writer, he's a speaker, as well as an art enthusiast. So I don't want to read all of this biography because it's not going to take, it's going to take us some time for us to read it all. I would like to invite him now to the podium just to speak to us about this foundation and also speak to the connections that we have started uh, some time ago. Father. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, uh, Vice-Chancellor, uh, Professor Buleng, and um, the President of the Southern African Council of Churches, Archbishop Makoba, Professor um, Pile, our speaker this day, whom we're very proud to have this day. May I acknowledge the Board of Trustees 
of the Fortaleza Foundation together with the Board of Trustees of, of, of Directors of the Sakumnoto Group with CEOs Tado Mashao and uh, Sipom Selegu who are here. On behalf of our Chairman, Professor Sipom Selegu, we're delighted to be in partnership in hosting this very important event. From the very beginning of our foundation, the three main areas that have been our focus, that is the pastoral care for families, indigent families of ministers of the gospel, for education and training, the advancement of training in all spheres, be it uh, from our very ordained ministers down to the ministries themselves, and engagements, public engagements, pretty much like the one that we're having now. It is for this reason that we always champion Christian organizations working together for the kingdom of God. And these religious virtues are the guiding post through which we guide our work as collaborators and as partners. And therefore, to have Professor Pile today introduces to us the very important work of religious diplomacy, which is driven primarily by human dignity. Organizations, much like all three that are gathered here today, have a duty to work harmoniously in such a way that those cadences strike a chord for all humanity. That is, in one voice, in unison, for the kingdom of God and for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Peace, therefore, Professor Pile, is indeed our Christian mandate. And the scriptures have reminded us at the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that the celestial beings sang peace to all people of goodwill. We are delighted this evening to be able to host you together with our partners, the Department of Philosophy, Practical Theology, and Systematic Theology of UNISA, whom we are proud to work with, our partners, uh, the South African Council of Churches, and above all, all people of goodwill. We thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Father. Now over to our choir. We'd want to invite them once again to serenade us uh, with the national anthem, please. Can I also, and thank you for that correction, uh, VC, ask all of us to please stand as we sing the national anthem.
of course, now we come to the moment we have all been waiting for. Our speaker of the day, and please bear me as I briefly summarize his CV. Reverend Professor Dr. Jerry Pillay stands as the distinguished general secretary of the World Council of Churches, a position he undertook on the 1st of January 2023, following his election by the WCC Central Committee on June the 17th, 2022. As the ninth general secretary in the WCC's history since in its inception in 1948, he bears the responsibility for the council's work and his dedicated staff. Hailing from the United Presbyterian Church in Southern Africa, Prof. Pillay brings a wealth of leadership experience, having served as the moderator of the UPCSA from 2004, ending in 2006, and subsequently as its General Secretary from 2009, ending in 2014. His commitment to ecumenism emerged early in his life, fostered in Sunday school and later manifested through various roles, including representation on the WCC Central Committee, and the Board of Trustees of the Council for World Mission. Prof. Pillay's vision as the General Secretary centers on fostering unity among churches, underscoring the transformative potential of collective action to address global changes. Beyond his pivotal role in the WCC, he has been a prominent figure among church leaders in South Africa, serving on the National Executive of the South African Council of Churches, and he was elected as the first president of the World Communion of the Reformed Churches from 2010 until 2017. Before his election as General Secretary of the WCC, he served as a Dean of the Faculty of Theology and Religion at the University of Pretoria. He earned his PhD from the University of Dawson Cape and has an ordinary doctorate from the Reformed University in Debrecen. Prof. Pillay has published many accredited academic articles and presented many lectures both nationally and internationally. And now I would like us to put our hands together as we invite him to the podium to address us in this public lecture. Good evening. It's really good to be home. Esteemed leaders from the SACC, the President, Archbishop Tabo, General Secretary, Bishop Maluzi, Vice Chancellor, Pulem Nankabula, Professor, uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you. And I want to say, as you spoke, I sat there feeling so proud that you have not lost your ecumenical fire. And thank you so much for acknowledging that. That's really. Uh, fantastic. And also the Fosha Loja uh, Foundation, Fosha Foundation, Father Lawrence, uh, good to have you. Thank you so much for the invitation to be present here and to deliver this lecture. It gives me great joy, sisters and brothers, uh, to be with you today as General Secretary of the World Council of Churches. And I bring you greetings from our 352 member churches and almost 600 million Christians in 120 countries in the world. The WCC was established in 1948, exactly 75 years ago this year, with the following mission. The primary purpose of the Fellowship of Churches in the World Council of Churches is to call one another to visible unity in one faith and in one Eucharistic fellowship, expressed in worship and common life in Christ through witness and service to the world, and to advance towards that unity in order that the world may believe. Formed in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, the perspectives and priorities of the World Council of Churches were marked from the outset by moral abhorrence at the suffering resulting from the atrocities perpetrated in the conflict at that time. In response, the WCC committed itself to working for the development of international law to promoting multilateral international cooperation and to a holistic approach to seeking 
a sustainable global peace founded on justice and human rights as we proclaim Jesus Christ to the world. Against this brief background, I value the opportunity given to me by the organizers of this lecture to speak to you on the theme, a Christian voice in a world in conflict. Right from the outset, I would like to say that I was requested to speak about the work of the WCC in relation to addressing conflicts in the world. So if you hear me speaking about the WCC, it is not a matter of blowing your own trumpet. Another disclaimer is that I will not talk about all the other work of the WCC in the many different areas of unity, theology, mission, ecumenical formation, and theological education. As difficult as it is, I will restrict my focus to the programmatic aspects in our Department of Public Witness and Diaconia as it relates to the topic under discussion. So firstly, let's look at the signs of our times and try to get an understanding of the global context in which we find ourselves. I am sure that you would agree with me in saying that we are living in very difficult times. The world is in crisis. Our current global context has been described as a polycrisis multiple threats of accelerating climate change, COVID-19 and its impacts, conflicts, ethnic and gender-based violence, war, displacements, hunger, poverty, and food insecurity, rising inequality and marginalization adds to the complexities and sufferings in the world. Currently, the world is living amidst terrible and unnecessary wars. We all know about Ukraine and Russia in the recent times, the Israel and Palestine war since October 7th this year, even though in this context this has been much longer with us since the occupation of Palestine in 1967. There are many more wars and conflicts going on that usually don't get much coverage. The ones that seem to matter most are the ones the Western powers are interested in. Others are insignificant, yet so costly to human lives and peace in communities. There are pres presently more than 45 armed conflicts taking place throughout the Middle East and North Africa. Many African countries continue to experience conflicts and tensions. For example, Sudan, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Nigeria, Cameroon, Egypt, to name just a few. What are the main factors for conflict? Researchers tell us that there are at least five main types of conflict. Information conflicts, when people do not have enough information or when they have wrong information. Value conflicts, when values are at clash with each other. Interest conflicts, when the interests of people are not met. Relationship conflicts, when people don't get on with each other. And structural conflicts, when there is systemic injustices. The major root causes include political, economic, and social inequalities, extreme poverty, economic stagnation, poor government services, high unemployment, environmental degradation, cultural dimension related to ethnicity or religion. Religious, religious conflicts are prevalent in many parts of the world. And while this may be the case, a closer examination will reveal that there are many grounded in socioeconomic and political tensions. I just returned from Nigeria, a place where there is lots of religious conflict, especially with the experience of Christians and Boko Haram. But the leaders, religious leaders, were able to confirm that this is the case in their context too. In Africa, conflicts are caused by a number of factors such as arbitrary borders created by the colonial powers, economic debt, vested interest in, col in colonial powers, even after independence, they continue to propagate tensions and divisions in the countries they once occupied. Other factors are ethnic issues, unstable political leadership, corruption, poverty, inaccessibility to quality health care, lack of good education, 
and declining economies. Conflicts are internal and international, meaning within states and between countries. In Africa, conflicts are mainly internal within states. The conflict picture I've painted is only partial and much, much worse. Currently, what has become more conspicuously evident is the conflicts generated by the climate emergency. It is obvious today, as the Apostle Paul describes in Romans chapter 8, verses 22 to 24, that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains. Today, the existential threat is global and threatens the integrity of life on Earth as we know it. The world is facing multiple shocks, geopolitically related, related to energy, economics, and a climate emergency. Yet the political establishments are marked by an inability or unwillingness to address these multidimensional and complex challenges. Rising global temperatures, but global mean temperatures for the past eight years have been the highest on record. We are facing something of that now in South Africa currently. Fueling environmental crisis, natural disasters, weather extremes, food and water insecurity, economic disruption, conflict and terrorism. Forest fires are becoming more widespread, burning nearly twice as much tree cover today as they did 20 years ago. Sea levels are rising, the Arctic is melting, coral reefs are dying, and oceans are acidifying. The number of weather-related disasters has increased by a factor of five over 50 years. The global north is responsible for 92% of excess historic emissions. The lack of willingness to share resources and to own up to the damage of excessive consumption by the rich is not only a huge problem between the wealthier and less wealthy nations, it is the reality within each society. The war in Ukraine has displaced 12.8 million people within Ukraine and to other countries, which adds to the more than 100 million people, one in every 78 persons on earth, who are forcibly displaced. The highest number ever recorded since World War II. The global public debt has been rising over the last six decades and has now reached its highest level. We live in a world where interest rates are raised to bring down rapidly rising inflation, which has little effect on lowering food prices. 828 million people go to bed hungry every night. And 3.1 billion people, nearly 40% of the world's population, cannot afford a healthy diet daily. Only a holistic and transformative response to these crises, which will even over overwhelm the political and societal impediments, can give us a respite from these existential challenges. We cannot overlook the African context that is already suffering the effects of climate change and environmental emergency. Political, economic, social, and even religious instability have a negative impact on the environment. The change of weather patterns, droughts, and floods impact negatively on agricultural production and food security. The pursuit of good governance, transparency, and the equitable distribution of resources remains a significant concern. Moreover, the COVID-19 pandemic has added an extra layer of complexity to these issues, underscoring the urgent need for holistic and compassionate responses. So the world is in conflict and crises. What is the Christian voice in such a world riddled with conflicts, pain, and suffering, as I briefly tried to explain them? In order to attempt to answer this question, I shall firstly refer to the ecumenical movement and share some brief insights into the work of the WCC in what we are doing to address these global challenges. And secondly, I will conclude with a section on what I think should be the Christian voice in a world in conflict. So let's look at the ecumenical response to conflict. In this section, I shall reflect on the prophetic, 
pastoral and practical ways in which the WCC is responding to global conflicts. At its 11th assembly held in Karlsruhe, Germany, in September 2022, representatives of the WCC's member churches reflected on the current perilous state of the world and adopted, among other important policy statements, a statement on the things that make for peace, moving the world to reconciliation and unity. The assembly observed that ours is a time of renewed and escalating global polarization, reconfiguration of governance and geopolitical alignments, division, confrontation, and military effects, with all the appealing risk attend, at, that attends into this particular context. It also acknowledged grave concerns about the instrumentalization of religious language, authority, and leadership to justify, support, or bless armed aggression, or any kind of violence and oppression, in sharp contrast to the Christian calling to be peacemakers. These threats to peace, the assembly declared, fundamentally violate the core tenets of the Christian faith, and stress that the calling to dialogue, encounter, and the pursuit of mutual understanding is the very essence of ecumenism and central to peacemaking. In its response to these realities, the WCC Assembly expressed its rejection of the polarization and division of the human community and declared the church's commitment to grapple with the threats and challenges to peace, justice, human security, and environmental sustainability through dialogue, encounter, the pursuit of mutual understanding and cooperation rather than through exclusion and confrontation. Returning to the WCC 11th Assembly statement, the Assembly was careful to describe the things that make for peace much more comprehensively than the simple cessation of violence. Indeed, it called for greatly increased investment by governments and other actors in the foundations of true human security and global stability, including for urgent action to achieve climate justice and to avert the climate emergency we are currently exp experiencing, and for a just transition to renewable energy, for the elimination of extreme poverty, for sustainable development, and for measures to control rampant inequality, all of which, if not addressed, will fuel conflict. I'm sure you would agree that statements, though they are necessary, are not enough, no matter how prophetic they may be. For this reason, I would like to share a few pastoral and practical engagements I have undertaken since assuming the office of General Secretary in January this year. My role as General Secretary started with a bang and no, in, no pun intended, as I was thrown into the deep end of the Ukraine-Russia war. I led a WCC delegation to both Ukraine and Russia to meet with church leaders and government officials to see how we could engage the powers that be to help end the war. The Orthodox churches in Ukraine and in Russia are over 70% of the population in each of these countries. So the intention was to gather these churches and the church leaders mainly, together with other stakeholders, at a round table in Geneva to work towards dialogue for peace. The hope was that we could call on Christians in these countries to put pressure on their governments to find peaceful solutions and to end the war. So the task in terms of the WCC approach was not a political one because we are not politicians. But we work with justice issues and our task was to call the churches into standing up for justice and for peace. While most of the churches expressed their support for a round table in October this year, in the end it was not possible to meet because of a number of complexities, including political blockages, and the fear of safety and security and the inability to guarantee that the participants would be able to return to Ukraine. 
One of the notable observations in this context is the instrumentalization of religion by politicians. I was deeply struck by how churches are used to justify war and similarly defend religious nationalism at the expense of the biblical call for peace, shalom, and wholeness and life. We challenge churches to speak the biblical language of peace rather than war and victory. But churches often find themselves in a fix of whom shall they please, God or Caesar? And very often for safety, security, nationalistic tendencies, and material benefits, they submit to Caesar and fail to live up to the Christian beliefs and values. The war in Ukraine is still with us, and the WCC will continue to seek and work toward the alternative pathway of peace, while the world says war and violence. Recently, I led a delegation to Armenia to establish the facts about the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh, also known as Artsakh. 120,000 people were denied access to humanitarian aid because a Lachin corridor was blocked by Azerbaijan. We were right near the Lachin corridor when Azerbaijan attacked and took over Nagorno-Karabakh. You know the rest. Most of the 120,000 people fled to Armenia and are now displaced refugees. Some say that this is a religious issue, but it is more than that. It is about economic pursuits and territorial borders and disputes. The sad thing here is that not much world coverage was given to this situation, primarily because this country is not of much economic interest to the so-called superpowers in the world. Fortunately, I was on site and managed to make a video recording that went worldwide, providing a global platform to speak about this situation. This is what the WCC does best. We provide a global platform for people to tell their stories, empowering the voices of the often voiceless for justice and peace. Interestingly enough, I was supposed to be visiting the WCC office in Jerusalem a few days after Hamas attacked, the, attacked Israel on the 7th of October. Of course, I had to postpone the trip under the current circumstances. The WCC had 20, 24 ecumenical accompaniers based in Jerusalem, something that we have been doing for decades. Unfortunately, we had to instruct that they be evacuated from Jerusalem. But the WCC office continues to work there, especially in those very trying times. I hope to lead an ecumenical delegation to Israel and Palestine in the near future. Needless to say that the situation in Gaza is totally out of control and unacceptable. The WCC condemned Hamas for its attack on Israel and has on, on numerous occasions condemned Israel's continued attack on, attack on Gaza. I think I put out about 15 statements on behalf of the WCC to this effect, condemning this continued attack on the Gaza. It is clear that this is no longer defense, but retaliation. It is unacceptable that over 14,000 people have been killed thus far, and there is no response to the call for a ceasefire. The WCC has condemned and will continue to condemn the merciless Israeli attacks on civilians, including children, hospitals, schools, and churches. The most alarming question is, why is the international community doing nothing to stop these senseless murders of innocent people? Of course, this is all about political allegiances and vested economic interest. It even borders on religious perspectives of Christians believing that the modern day Israel is the biblical Israel and therefore must be protected. Of course, this is absolutely not the case. President Biden has unwaveringly supported Israel refusing to call for a ceasefire, not expressing a desire for dialogue for peace. We think violence is going to bring peace. It is a false assumption and expectation. What brings peace is dialogue and negotiations. Ultimately, dialogue has to happen. But why do we have to suspend that for later, after the loss of so many lives 
destruction of properties, and environmental degradation. Common logic tells us that we must dialogue now for peace, but it seems that we prefer violence. The very recent WCC statement on Israel and Palestine demands an immediate ceasefire and the opening of the humanitarian corridors. There is currently, as we know, a humanitarian pause that ends today. But this is not enough. There must be a complete ceasefire. We have urged the UN and relevant authorities to investigate all war crimes and other violations of international humanitarian law committed against, uh, committed since, uh, violation of humanitarian laws committed since October 7. Among the other calls, the WCC refutes all those who seek to portray the current conflict in religious terms, misusing scripture to justify violence, killing, cruelty, and oppression. We reject and denounce all such efforts to distract from the root causes of the conflict in the region. One of the major projects of the WCC is peace and reconciliation. My reference has merely singled out some of the areas I have addressed since becoming General Secretary. But the WCC over the years have addressed conflict and continues to address situations in most part of the world. We are still busy with, for example, Sudan, where I will be in the near future leading a delegation because it wasn't possible to do it this year. In the DRC, Ethiopia, Myanmar, West Papua, Colombia, and I'm pleased to say that we were invited as a WCC by the President of Colombia to facilitate in the peace-breaking process. And I will be in Colombia in the second week of December to meet with government officials, including the President, to discuss that further. The Middle East, of course, speaks for itself. Syria, Iraq, Lebanon. The WCC puts a lot of time, effort, and resources into addressing conflicts in the world. Peace and reconciliation is one of our strongest program areas. We want to see the flourishing of people and planet. As most of you know, the WCC played a very significant role in dismantling apartheid in our country. The Council stood in solidarity with oppressed South Africans, supported sanctions, and established a program on combating racism. It brought church leaders together, mobilized the international community to act against apartheid, and supported churches in South Africa in the struggle for liberation. It provided funding and scholarships to train black leaders, mainly abroad, many of whom have led the liberation struggle in our country and have since become leaders in politics, religion, society, business, and other sectors since the advent of democracy in 1994. I take great joy in serving the WCC at this time as General Secretary. Perhaps it's an opportunity to give back to an organization that continues to join in the struggles of many others in seeking unity and just peace in the world. However, I must admit that I feel a deep sense of sadness in seeing that South Africa continues to struggle for economic liberation and political liberation has not delivered the goods to establish a fully stable and peaceful country. The country is saturated with unemployment, especially among youth, corruption at all levels, economic and social inequalities, gender-based violence, which is the biggest in the world, in this country, load shedding that affects the economy, lingering effects of state capture, racial and ethnic conflicts. We seem to have detoured from the legacy that Nelson Mandela and many others once stood and fought for. We need to return to these values and not allow political power, greed and corruption occupy our leadership instead of caring for the poor, neglected and needy. It's time we jump out of the gravy train and enter into the train of goodwill, justice and peace, seeking a better South, African, a better South Africa for all people. Any political party that thinks that it will rule until Jesus comes is sorely misguided if it does not take seriously the needs of the people it governs. Just as the people rose to say enough to apartheid, 
the day will come and they will rise to say enough to a government that does not deliver the goods to provide a safe, secure and stable country for all people. In concluding the section on the ecumenical response to world conflicts, it would not be complete if I did not say something about the WCC response to the climate emergency. The current ecological crisis is a major challenge for humanity. In recent years, theologians and leaders of various churches and ecumenical organizations have addressed this issue. In fact, the WCC has for many, many years been dealing with the issue of climate change. The WCC Assembly in 1961 in New Delhi reinterpreted creation and redemption in a cosmic key giving rise to the faith and order study on God in nature and history. Taking this further, the Vancouver Assembly in 1983 called churches to make a common commitment to justice, peace, and the integrity of creation. The Canberra Assembly of the, of the WCC in 1991 met under the theme, Come Holy Spirit, renew the whole creation. Subsequently, the WCC has continued its work on justice, peace, and integrity of creation in its work on eco-justice. The 11th Assembly of the WCC highlighted the climate emergency as a significant priority for the Council to engage and act on. In fact, it considers the climate crisis so urgent that it has recently established a Commission on Climate Change and Sustainable Development. The recent Executive Committee meeting in Abuja, Nigeria, called on governments to act on phasing out fossil fuel, working towards 1.5 Celsius, call for compliance with the Paris Agreement on Climate Justice, and call for the implementation of the Loss and Damage Agreement and Climate Finance. While some of us may perceive climate crisis to be important for us to focus on as Christians, yet many others do not. They also cite biblical reasons for their position. Perhaps the most important argument they make is that protecting nature is not the central task of the church. They establish a spiritual task such as evangelization, the saving of souls, are, the more important, are more important than creation care. Proclaiming the salvation of Christ to the world is the only mission of the church, they say. They believe that human beings are more important than nature. Helping a starving person or an exploited person seems more important, for example, than trade, fur trade coffee. They are more interested in local matters rather than in global issues. Further, they believe that God will take care of God's creation, and therefore, they need not worry about this. God will not allow his creation to be destroyed by humans. God will sustain the world, so they believe. Closely related to trusting God is the eschatological view that the present world will pass away and God will create a new world. This view diminishes the focus on creation care and gives tendency to deny the climate crisis that is already upon us. Sadly, this includes many Christians as well. Theological and biblical perspectives on God and creation, God and human responsibility, and the kingdom of God are some themes that support the Christian involvement in creation care. In a nutshell, Christians are called to care for the earth because it belongs to the Lord. We are called to be responsible stewards and citizens to provide for future generations. And God's kingdom is not only spiritual, but it embraces the economic, political, and social aspects of the whole life. Therefore, it is incumbent upon us to work for the good of the earth and indeed the glory of God. Moltmann captures this well. He sees God as eminent in his creation. This means that his spirit is very is the very spirit of the universe, sustaining the initial creation out of his creative energy. Creation is thus not simply a single event occurring in the past, but a continuing event right up to the advent of the eschaton. It is both a creation out of nothing and a creation in continuity. Human beings are invited to share in this responsibility of bringing the world to its ultimate destiny in God's in the way God has intended it. We can no longer thus see ourselves as rulers over nature, 
but must think of ourselves as gardeners, caretakers, mothers and fathers, stewards, trustees, lovers, priests, co-creators, and friends of a world that while giving us life and sustenance also depends increasingly on us in order to continue both for itself and for others. The earth is facing a climate emergency. Our God-given responsibility is to care for the earth and keep it good as God intended it to be. This must be the voice or the Christian voice at this time. Talking about the Christian voice, I shall now return to my final section in this presentation to ask what should be a Christian voice in the midst of a world in conflict? The WCC at its assembly last year decided to continue with what we call a pilgrimage of justice, reconciliation, and unity. This pilgrimage will direct and embody the life, witness, and programmatic work of the council over the next eight years when we will meet again at the next assembly in 2030. I shall draw from this to express what should be our Christian voice in a world in conflict. And yeah, I would bring four brief points. Firstly, the Christian voice should be a voice calling out for repentance. In the midst of conflicts, there are invariably acts of sinfulness, injustice, and immoral behavior. In such a context, the first duty of the church is to issue the call for repentance. Sometimes we may be the lonely voice crying out in the wilderness, repent and believe. But that is our task as church something we fail to do today because we want to be popular, acceptable, and polite. But it has led to co-option and cooperation with the powers that be that propagate evil, injustice, and corruption. Metanoia, repentance, means a complete turning around from our own agendas and surrendering, surrendering to the will and ways of God. Repentance is inclusive of all sins, be they political, social, economic, or religious. Repentance is linked to creation. The opening sentence of the statement, the living planet, seeking a just and sustainable global community, adopted by the 11th assembly of the WCC in Karlsruhe, shows this connection between repentance and creation. It says, and I quote, together we believe the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Human beings created in God's own image are called to serve as faithful and responsible caretakers of God's precious, unique creation, of which we are at the same time an inherent part and inextricably dependent on the health of the whole natural world. A narrow, anthropocentric understanding of our relationship with creation must be revised to a whole of life understanding to achieve a sustainable global ecosystem. We are all interdependent in God's whole creation. As Christ's love moves the world to reconciliation and unity, we are called to metanoia and a renewed and just relationship with creation that expresses itself in our practical life." End of quotation. The church must refuse to go on with business as usual in these times of conflict and violence. South Africans are resilient when it comes to addressing our challenges, including load shedding. We learn to adjust and live on. But in the context of sin and injustice and conflicts, we must refuse to normalize the abnormal, to give credibility to the immoral, and to accept the illegal wars, conflicts, and factions that continue to pervade our context and world. Let us have the courage without fear or favor to prophetically call people into repentance and say, thus says the Lord. But we need to first start with ourselves. Yes. We cannot call others to repentance when we are guilty of the same sins, when we practice racism, gender imbalances, and all of those things that comes that we experience in the world. We need to practice what we preach to protect the credibility of our Christian witness and message. Secondly, the Christian voice should be crying out for justice. 
The cry for freedom and justice is loud for many in the world today. God uses a number of instruments to reach and transform the world, including and especially the church. Therefore, the church needs to hear and respond to this painful cry. The mission of the church is to follow in the footsteps, footsteps of proclaiming Christ's love to the world. The church needs to stand where God stands and not get mixed up with the rich and powerful. The language of love is best expressed in standing up for the truth and siding with the poor. The God portrayed in scripture is the lover of justice. He who executes justice for the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. Who pushed Moses to become the liberator, smashed the shackles of Pharaoh and led the people to a new homeland. Faithfulness to covenant relationship demands a justice that recognizes special obligations, a preferential option to widows, orphans, the poor, and aliens. In other words, the economically vulnerable and politically oppressed. The Jubilee year prevented unjust concentrations of power and poverty by requiring the return of property every 50 years. Justice then is the ethical core of the biblical message. Hence, it is a moral imperative for Christians, especially in our time. Human beings are moral agents and agents of social change. We need to possess the power to make positive moral choices and engage in liberative actions aimed at the transformation of society in accordance with the moral norm of justice. Justice demands that we focus especially on meeting the needs of the poor and oppressed both domestically and globally. Justice must also be extended to non-human life. Thus, economic policies and systems must also be evaluated socially and ecologically on the basis of the benefits and harms to the well-being of all in our interdependent relationships. Economic policies that allow the rich to get richer and the poor to get poorer must not be tolerated. Economic policies that enable some to get more benefits and others to be deprived must be confronted and resisted with all perseverance. The struggle for social justice is the transformation of existing structures of state, economic order and society, so that the poor and oppressed may become full participants in the total life of society. Humankind must be actively, radically involved in the creation of a just society. In harmony with divine purpose, the human being must be radically involved in the struggle for justice and willing to suffer courageously for the redemption of the human community. As we seek and work for justice, Christians must demand for the upholding of international law, which today seems to be seriously disrespected. International humanitarian and, right, and human rights law offer our best and only protection against the brutal, right, br brutal rule of might makes right. In the current geopolitical context, it should be the common first priority of faith leaders from every, every religious tradition to insist on the continuing importance of these principles to demand that all governments fulfill their legal and moral responsibility to ensure the unbiased and consistent application of these principles in all contexts and to refuse to be the pawns of politicians and demagogues. Justice is also a very significant theological aspect of responding to the urgent environmental crisis. At first glance, environmental issues may not seem to be divisive for churches. However, when we look at the churches in the national and geographical context, complexities and divisions emerge. Ecological efforts often confront national, economic, and political interest. National and regional government decisions about climate are often shaped by the economic development interest of each nation or region. Thus, many WCC studies linking poverty, wealth, and ecology have concluded that the merciless mutilation of the earth in search of profits is such that the productive and regenerative limits of the planet have now been overstepped. The WCC document on cultivation and care makes the point that justice in and for creation cannot be addressed separately from attention to the entanglement of ecology, economy, and cultural identity. The rights and responsibilities associated with the image of God are inextricably linked and tied to the stress on justice in scripture and tradition. 
Love is seeking the well-being of others in response to their needs and to the God who is love. And justice is an indispensable dimension of love and full respect for their rights. We render to others their due because of our loving respect for their God-given dignity and value. Hence, distributive justice must be a critical focus of our global social and ecological responsibilities. The third aspect is that the Christian voice must be working for peace and reconciliation. In the midst of conflict, we must be the voice for peace and reconciliation. It seems that the powers and principalities of the world do not like these words. It is hard to believe that in the context of war and violence, political leaders do not wish to pave the way for dialogues for peace. The Christian voice must refuse to become entangled in such narratives. Ours must be a way for peace, and in seeking this, we must work with everyone engaging the same mission, NGOs, people of other faiths, and even with no faith. The task of peace and reconciliation includes a number of players, including politicians and humanitarian organizations. The WCC, as a Christian organization, works with many organizations to find solutions to conflicts in the world. Peace and reconciliation must include work in helping people to come to terms with their realities to seek forgiveness and to forgive others who have persecuted and acted unjustly against them. In the South African experience after apartheid, there was the call for forgiveness and reconciliation. The ability of those who have been wronged to forgive the oppressors and offenders is no easy task. Forgiveness is complex. The process of forgiveness is recognizing that we cannot change the event itself, but we can change the meaning we give to the event. Thus, victims are often unwilling to let go of the emotional ties associated with the hurt, bitterness, and vengefulness, and hatred toward the perpetrators. Yet, many South Africans did ask for forgiveness, and many others forgave those who violated their rights and human dignity. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission, with its many failures in meeting its full objectives, still provided a facility to help people to face their oppressors and to find healing and forgiveness. Many churches appeared before the TRC and confessed of their own complicity, silence, and, a part, and part in promoting apartheid in South Africa. It is apparent that forgiveness is important to find reconciliation and healing. In the quest for reconciliation and unity, forgiveness becomes an essential point of departure. Forgiveness is an important part of reconciliation. You can forgive someone and still refuse to be reconciled with them. But to seek reconciliation, forgiveness is a necessity. Forgiveness is possible without reconciliation. Reconciliation, however, is not possible without forgiveness. Hence, the trend towards restorative justice involves traditional justice, transitional justice, to cultivate an environment that fosters social change through forgiveness and reconciliation after a period of conflict. Following the example of Christ's love, churches ought to help people to be brought into spaces to forgive, be forgiven, and seek reconciliation. The love of Christ reconciles a lost and broken world, not only to God, but to the whole creational order, which is renewed by the sacrifice of Christ. The doctrine of reconciliation is a prominent theme in the New Testament, and the theological essence of the concept is expressed in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, which reads about being ambassadors of reconciliation. In this sense, reconciliation is God's gift to not only reconcile fallen humankind with God's self, but also with all humanity in creation. The church as a reconciled community has to display unity, peace, justice, and love. The church should not perpetuate human divisions on race, ethnicity, gender, etc. Rather, it ought to strive towards reconciliation and unity. If this is the case, then the church needs to articulate reconciliation and unity within its own life and witness so that the world may know the love of Christ. The church must work towards the renewal of all relationships and the restoration of human relationships with creation. As reconciled people, they have to be the proponents 
of ecological concerns and the precursors of the restoration of the integrity of creation. The church is called to constantly work towards forgiveness, reconciliation, and unity, bearing in mind its, ag its agency in transforming society so that all may have the fullness of life. Forgiveness ought to set the social condition for the process of reconciliation to restore and heal not only interpersonal relationships, but also constructively rebalance the political, legal, and economic injustices toward preventing the prospect of renewed conflict. And finally, the Christian voice, voice should be a voice for unity. As we address the various conflicts in the world, it is important for churches to seek unity and to work together. Apart from the fact that Jesus put, prayed for unity of Christians so that the world may believe in John 17, global challenges warrants that we work together to heal, reconcile, and restore creation. The Christian voice for unity is not restricted to the church, but to the unity of all humankind and the total unity of all creation. In this respect, unity and justice go together as two sides of a coin. For 75 years, the vision of the WCC has been expressed as a commitment to stay together, pray together, move together, and act together as a fellowship of churches seeking visible unity and common witness. Most recently, the 11th Assembly invited the churches to continue the journey together as a pilgrimage of justice, reconciliation, and unity. And it said this in its statement. We affirm the vision of the WCC for the visible unity of all Christians, and we invite other Christians to share this vision with us. We also invite all people of faith and goodwill to trust with us that a different world, a world respectful of the living earth, a world in which everyone has daily bread and life in abundance, a decolonized world, a more loving, harmonious, just, and peaceful world is possible. In a world weighed down with so much pain, anguish, and fear, we believe that the love we have seen in Christ brings the liberating possibilities of joy, justice for all, and, pieces, and peace with the earth. Moved by the Holy Spirit, compelled by a vision of unity, we journey on together, resolved to practice Christ's love, following his steps as his disciples, and carrying a torch, of, a torch for love in the world, trusting in the promise that Christ's love moves the world to reconciliation and unity from the unity statement of the 11th Assembly. It is clear from this statement that Christian unity is needed to witness and to transform the world as we address conflicts, divisions, brokenness, and pain. Christian disunity is nothing but a feeble, weak, and contradictory message to a fragmented world. Let me repeat that. Christian unity is nothing but a feeble, weak, and contradictory message to an already fragmented world. In this lecture, I have attempted to describe some of the conflicts in the world, looked at the importance of the Christian voice in such a context by mainly reflecting on some of the witness and work of the WCC in this regard. I concluded by stating that the Christian voice must be a voice of justice, peace and reconciliation, and unity, as we call people into repentance. Conflict is always going to be with us, but we must never give up proclaiming and being the Christian voice, charting and declaring the way of Christ. May the God of justice, love and peace, give us courage and strength to cry for peace in the world in the midst of increasing conflicts and wars and where there is no peace in the valley. Let us go out and untiringly continue to work for justice, peace and reconciliation, and unity in the world. Let us hold out light and hope in a world of conflict. God calls us to be God's people and presence in the world. Let us live up to the calling that he has given us as Christians. Thank you and God bless.
Thank you very much, Prof. Pile, for that very well-rounded paper. You know, trying very hard to balance the global with the local. The challenges are many, but you did well in that regard. I would like now uh, to allow for some time for questions uh, so that at least you are able to elaborate even more where people might not have understood well. We have about uh, 20 minutes uh, just to ask questions and to allow for him to respond to our questions. Is there a mic maybe that we can use on the stage here? Yes, so can I, can I take a round of hands, please? <laughs> For questions. <laughs> right. That's a good one. <clears throat> okay, our first hand, we note the first hand in the back. So let's just take one round and then we'll come back again. So one, two, three, four, and five. Then you respond and then we take another round. Just in the order that I've, I've, I've noted them. Thank you, uh, Prof, for the admonishment, the call to have a voice in this conflicted world. But what struck me the most is your finishing line that you repeated about an ununited church to an already broken world. My question therefore, been listened to all that we have said, perhaps what is then the work of the World Council of Churches in addressing theologies that divides and encourage that division. And secondly, theology supports the superpowers and encourages the church to stand on the side of the rich, oppressive, violent, murderous, and truly speaking, unmerciful regimes. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, GS. I am the former EAPPI participant. I was in the State of Israel last year. I was there in June. I came back in South Africa in September. Now, I wanted to understand, because um, when I was there, I've seen so much horrendous things. I've seen so much pain, you know, when I was visiting the villages and the accusations that were leveled against us as internationals were the fact that we are there, we gather reports, we fit into the systems, and then it goes through to the UN, but nothing is really done to alleviate what is currently happening there. Now my question is, what is the position of the WCC in terms of a humanitarian stance when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian issues, shying away from the geo-macro-political context of what is happening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. I think she took what I was going to ask about uh, the accompaniment program of the SACC, or of the WCC, during the current chaos that is in uh, Palestine. Uh, are they still operating? Is there anybody accompanying the, uh, the victims at the moment? Thank you. All right. Number four here. Thank you, Program Director, and uh, good evening to you, Professor, and all the dignitaries here. Uh, my name is Molly Lamini. I, I grew up in the ecumenical student movement, but I'm here with Fortlosa Foundation today. My question mixed with a comment is considering that there's confusion about the biblical Israel and the political construct of a state, 
by the way, this state, at some point, there was talk about whether uh, Israel sh should be born in Uganda or other two more countries, I think. So even the, the current location was, was, was not a, 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 you know, was part of the options, of the many options. So there's, there's a, a confusion about this, the biblical Israel and the political construct of a state. And my, my question would be to the WCC and, and, the, and the, you know, the broader progressive church that is here and outside, uh, what, what is it that can be done to, to really educate the broader Christian community that has a particular thinking, which is sadly, and I say this, this with, with all the sensitivity in me, you know, uh, you know, that could be misguided about this fact. Thanks. The last one was over there. Good evening. Thank you so much. I just want to make the greetings to all the archbishops and the pastors and everyone in the house. My name is Musa, and I'm coming from uh, the Unity Pastoral Forum. Currently, we are in Tembisa. I just want to ask the question that actually it is hurting us the most as pastors to see that what has been highlighted, what has been lectured by Prof to look at the reconciliation to look at uh, advocating for justice, for peace, and advocating also for the unity, and that becoming the voice of the church that must be able to speak louder in South Africa. I actually see, you know, our leaders, especially the South African Council of Churches, coming down to the forum of pastors, to the forums of pastors, whereby we can able to come and advocate for that kind of a peace. I want to ask this question um, because I think we've got a problem of the platform. How does we uh, find the platform to be able to advocate for what actually the prof has? Thank you very much. Hopefully. Thank you so much for those questions. Um, firstly, the, what is the work of the WCC in addressing theologies that divide? Um, lots of programs are actually in place to try and address issues that theological. Uh, one of the greatest gifts of the WCC is the Faith and Order Commission. And that has been there for many, many decades. And it integrates the voices of different Christian traditions and really looks quite deeply theologically on issues. The one thing that the WCC really puts forward strongly is deep theological undergirding of what it stands for. And that strength is there for many, many decades. So one could look at the material. But of course, we live in a world where theologies rise and rise. Uh, pastors get visions and prophecies and spirit leads them, and, and much times what the spirit leads them is biblically untenable. And you wonder, is that the same spirit? Uh, we need to use the Bible as our key yardstick in terms of measuring what people claim to be true and holy and good and Christian. So we've got the tools. We need to use them appropriately to be able to see uh, whatever is being propagated, biblically tenable or not. But in the same breath, we should also be prophetic and courageous enough to denounce that which is not. Theologies that separate us and divide us, theologies that actually espouse a sense of disunity amongst people, violates people's rights and beliefs uh, as Christians and others, uh, just purely human beings, needs to be in question. So, um, Theologies in terms of the superpowers. This is a struggle in terms of Western theologies. Struggle against. 
No, I don't think so. It's, they got scared of you guys, they put it back on. Uh, so the, the, there's always that there. But we, knew that we need the rising of new theologies. And liberation theology, black theology, African Christian theology, feminist theology, all of these theologies have actually brought new injections of different theological understandings. And that's the kind of to, to challenge uh, these dividing theologies. EA, PPI, thank you so much. I'm pleased to hear that you was one of the accompaniers. That's wonderful. And I know that that in itself is a life-changing experience. When people go there, they are never the same when they come back. But your question is particularly with regards to humanitarian stance. The WCC will always continue to advocate for humanitarian support. No matter what, people should not be denied access to food, medical support, et cetera, et cetera. And we have been very strong on that. We've been calling for this in the current climate uh, and context of the war. And we are saying that humanitarian support must not be denied. And we've said that categorically, clearly, numerous times. And we will continue to do that. I am pleased now about the humanitarian pause and that people are receiving assistance. But it cannot stop at this. There must be far more than that. As I said, there must be a ceasefire completely. And humanitarian assistance must reach people. But you know, people like yourselves, who take it upon yourselves to go and spend three months uh, in Israel-Palestine, to know what happens there, comes back and you are the champions that goes and tell other people who do not know these things. Uh, when I went and experienced that for myself, that's what prompted me to write even academically on my experience. And I think that's, that's what changes things. When people go and immerse themselves, that becomes the best way of learning what other people go through. Um, accompaniment, uh, yes, the program is still in place. We had to take our staff, um, accompaniers, their volunteers, as you know. I had to give an instruction to evacuate them because we could not guarantee the safety. But they are still continuing the program virtually. So they will complete the program. And we are having constant meetings. I, myself, uh, meet with uh, our staff. We have a ad advocacy group in Jerusalem that I speak to and ask them about what is happening on the ground. And of course, the heads of churches, they advise me. So I have regular meetings with them virtually. To us course, under the current climate, not much can be done practically. But we will be still looking at what more we can do in the company and program. Although the situation is what it is now, I've even already appointed staff, as from January next year, that will continue the program. So we have not stopped because this is more needed than much before. Biblical Israel versus political construct, that is a debate that has been with us for a long time. And it depends from where we come and how we want to understand this conversation. Um, there are people, there are Christians who will refuse to understand the differentiation between biblical Israel and a modern Israel. And sometimes it is very difficult to even persuade them otherwise. But the most important thing is that to understand that the modern Israel is not the biblical Israel described in the scriptures to us. Now, I have Jewish rabbis who are colleagues that I work with. And they are part of the Council of Rabbis and an international group of people. And they always say to me, please make a difference a distinction between political Israel and Jews. They tell us that. Make a distinction because they're saying to me that the political people of Israel are who are the ones messing the world up, not Jews. And sometimes I think it's an important thing to understand because they feel the pain as a religious community being accused of the acts of politicians. I found it a little bit helpful and useful to understand the dynamics, but sometimes I think this is how, the point I want to try and make is that Christians show allegiance to Israel because the Bible says we must, without stopping to ask about justice, without stopping to ask about peace, without stopping to ask about what does Jesus teach us about standing up for truth. Those are far more important questions. 
that needs to be examined before we can say, yes, we support them because they, they are people of the same Abrahamic faith. The fact of the matter is, even if Christians are not standing up for justice, we as Christians should not even support them. Because we must challenge them to believe that they are not good practicing Christians. So therefore, Christians who actually have these kind of uh, insights and do not want to really understand, I would say to them, the best way for them to come to understanding is to go to these particular places in Israel, Palestine, but don't go on these tours that many wonderful Christians take us to understand the beautiful Israel from a Christian perspective. Immerse that with the experience of Palestinian Christians to understand the realities of what, and this is what people don't understand, that even in Palestine, it's not only Arab, Muslims, they are Arab Christians. Understand the pain and suffering of those people before we start to actually say, God wants us to do this because of Israel. So that will be the point. But education, immersion, going to with the right people, even allowing Palestinians to help us to understand these only tours will bring new insights and experiences to understanding that. Peace, justice, unity, a voice of the church, the platform, I think we do need platforms. Because platforms help us to gain more uh, forceful, powerful inroads into making significant changes of transformation. But the platform begins with me. With me standing up and, and really proclaiming what I believe as a believer that Jesus calls me to do. And then we join with all the other platforms that are available to us. Uh, I don't want to speak for the SACC, but I do know that the SACC, all my years of experience with them, that in leadership as well, that they've always tried to be that voice. They've always tried to work for justice and reconciliation. Sometimes media does not give us that exposure. Sometimes it is difficult because resources do not make certain things possible and practical. But that does not mean that there is no platform. We must always seek to ask, how can we strengthen that platform? What can we contribute to making that a strong and formidable platform from we can? I, th I think we have some time for a last round. So if there are questions, we have a last round. There's one hand right at the back there. There's another hand here. There is a third hand here. Looks like there's a fourth one. A last one. OK, this, this two. You have noted it again. We, we start with that one over there at the corner. Greetings, um, the name is Cindy Soren Tlavati. Um, it's always a name to come to these sessions by Fortloza. And um, thank you so much for the, for the lecture. <laughs> um, drum on a particular matter that um, you ended off when, which is peace and reconciliation. And um, in the perspective of the global Christian movement, I come from the reformed Christian movement, and it's always a, a hard one for me knowing the history of apartheid in the reformed church within South Africa, and how the reformed church was pretty much a supporter of uh, the, con the, the, the oppression of the people at the time. But one critical thing somebody highlighted earlier on today that in South Africa the church was united across the board, whether it's a traditional, Af it's a traditional African church, the Roman Catholic, um, Methodist, uh, the Zionist, and so forth. And as you rightly said, there's a, there, 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 were, there were Jews, who, there's Jews and there's political 
um, this political juice. And that is where I'm at. What has WCC communicated to the UN in terms of understanding that particular thing that political views of what is happening in the Gaza Strip and how things are are not necessarily a reflection of the entire society. In South Africa right now, a group of uh, Jews against the war in Israel went to the council chamber, or what is it called, legislature of the Western Cape. And the Western Cape um, uh, legislature responded by kicking them out of the legislature and putting them as supporters of terrorists. And that alone is a reflection of not being able to separate uh, from the conflict and the faith or the person. And that is where I'm at. So looking at peace and, peace and reconciliation, how then do we help amplify these voices of Jewish communities who say what is happening there is wrong? Then you go into Ukraine, similar thing. Separating the people who are saying to Russia, what is what you're doing there throwing missiles is not right. The church that uh, Putin goes to supported him, oh. but not all of one in the Orthodox Church stands with that particular view. All Thank right. you. Okay. Could we just assist one another, guys? Let's just be brief and to the point so that we allow him enough time to respond to that. We understand that you do want to give some background, but let's just try and see whether we can't do it as uh, brief as possible. There was a second hand. Or maybe they withdraw the hands then. No problem. There's the hand here, here at the back. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for an insightful lecture. My question really is on, uh, I want you to elaborate more on when you say geopolitical realignment and um, government's reconfiguration. What do you really mean by that? Thank you. Good. The next one. This one. I say my, my, my concern is on the voice of the church unity and, and Christian witness. Um, as you said, a pilgrimage for justice and peace. In a place or in a world where there are competing theologies that often take advantage of the, the vulnerable and those who are underprivileged, um, how can the church unite? I mean, how can we even call for the, un the unity of the church where we have deliberate um, a, a churches that would do take advantage of of the people who are vulnerable. So for me, the the, yeah. the, the cause is there that we are not all looking at the same, having the same vision and going into the same direction as that of Jesus. Thank Good. you. All right, that one, and then the last one here. Thank you, Prof. My name is Jablan from SACC. My question is on the issue of peace and reconciliation, but I just want to understand um, how does reconciliation look like, particularly in the context of Palestine and Israel? Does it include a restitution or it just a reconciliation that does not include restitution? Thank you. Okay, we've added one now, briefly, briefly. Sir, so after apartheid we had the TRC <laughs> because we needed a safe space in which to unpack the scars of what had happened with us during apartheid. In the context now of the 
Palestinian conflict, how will the World Council of Churches assist all those who are now suffering a collective trauma? Broken people result in a broken nation. The church is clearly entrusted with the task of care. We cannot take that gift for granted. What is the response in respect of collective trauma? Good stuff. Good question. Last one here. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my question, one is, what is um, WCC? What is the WCC's approach or plan to actually restore and revive the respect and the honor first in the church and secondly to our government right now we are standing in the in a situation where i personally feel that uh, the church is being somehow oppressed in uh, in in a, in a, in a start um there's an advocation of the multicultural or multi-religious uh, society and all that. When you raise a voice as a church or as a Christian, then there will be the uh, maybe there will be saying uh, we are we are not supposed to impose our religion. And uh, when we talk about repentance, if we can repent, as our national anthem is saying if we can repent and go back to, to God, some of the problems, or actually most of the problems that we are facing as a country, as a society, we will never be facing. Okay. Thank you. So as we allow uh, Prof. Billy to respond, we are also uh, following the conversation online. So I'm going to ask Tepo just to read some of the comments there because my battery is about to die as we prepare to respond so that we also just get a sense of what colleagues are or what those who are attending on social media are thinking of the conference. Just a few that you sent me, uh, Tepo. Uh, I think just uh, let me just read two of or two or four of them. Uh, the first one it's the statement made by Archbishop Mahoba: We cannot just speak about conflict and not com and commit to action. Echoes the call for effective policies and tangible uh, results. It is important that both international humanitarian and human rights laws are applied without bias, regardless of the geographic. I think it's just quotations from. Uh, 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 from from the paper from Professor uh, Pillay. Yeah, I think it's it's okay. The last one. Uh, thank you, SACC, UNISA, and Fortlasa Foundation for luring this theological giant to our shores. This I see as doing theology rather than just preaching it. This giant reminds me of uh, our own. Yeah, I think that's how it's. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you again for that second set of questions. Uh, very quickly, uh, with regards to the question from the Global Christian Movement and part of the Reformed Church, uh, Peace and Reconciliation, what has WCC communicated to the UN? Well, uh, firstly, I want to say, if you read our last statement, uh, particularly in Israel-Palestine, uh, one of the things that we did quite courageously is that we've actually asked the UN to not be partisan in its approach. Uh, it needs to say what it needs to say loudly and clearly. But we too, as from the WCC, realize that sometimes there are challenges when we have to say something loudly and clearly for ourselves because we constitute various different people who have different opinions about what one says. Uh, in terms of protecting people, I think that's an important point, that if you've got Jewish communities of people coming out and supporting uh, the situation in terms of speaking about the plight of the Palestinian people, uh, it's not easy because they get targeted. And, and the difficulty is in trying to actually say, how do we protect these people? Uh, in some senses, it is really impossible to do that. But in other senses, the closeness of the human touch, the closeness of us enjoying the friendship of possibilities with people and, and encouraging them to constantly stand up for truth and justice is one way in which we can meet that. 
But it's really a difficult thing. Uh, I've seen people who have come up and taken particular, particular stunts uh, on subjects and pay the price for it. But it's something that we have to work together with as we address those issues. Geopolitical um, realignments, basically that's a ref reference to what happens in regions, what happens in contexts. Very often the voices of the church get muddled up and entangled with authorities and powers in that context. And so we speak the language of politicians, we speak the language of the state, and one of the things that we see so visibly these days is that even across the world, many people tend to actually tell us and give to us even as Christians what their particular uh, governments give to them as policies or practices and so forth. So there is this impact of influence from geopolitical settings that speaks to the church and the church unconsciously gets caught up in that narrative. Uh, the voice of the church in terms of uh, competing theologies, but not only do we have competing theologies, unfortunately some Christians are fooled by what may be called as compelling theologies. And the compelling theologies is how to get rich quickly, how to be blessed from your poverty, and the so-called prosperity gospel uh, kind of theologies. Those are, those are things that we deal with consistently, and we need to be teaching biblical truth in these. It's not difficult to say what the scripture says about these things, but we really need to have the courage to, to be able to say it without being condescending, without being judgmental, but yet standing in terms of what we believe the scriptures tell us. But others will tell us they believe the scriptures tell the story that they relate. But we need to be more circumspect about how we actually theologically exegete some of those verses and scriptures that are used. Um, of course, uh, reconciliation must include restorative justice, transitional justice. True reconciliation is never going to be unless justice finds its way into the healing process of those communities and people. So you cannot minus justice from that. Justice, restorative justice, reparations, are all part and parcel to the conversation of how true reconciliation can be established. Uh, the WCC, um, with regards to the question on Palestine and the TRC, I think you're absolutely correct about that, that when all of this is said and, said and done, and when we're about to pick up the pieces again with regards to Israel-Palestine, it's going to require a lot of work, a lot of work. But I'm hoping that also there will be a lot of investigations that you may, the international law will be applied and will be investigated in terms of what we have experienced. And hopefully that can bring some healing in the context. But the trauma of this conflict, the trauma of those people displaced and those people who have lost loved ones, over 14,000 lives in this process. Collective trauma, as you call it, is going to require a lot of collective work. The WCC is willing to actually engage in that. We will. Uh, we have people working with the WCC in our different departments that work with trauma uh, and mental wellness and so forth. And we will give guidance uh, to this process if required. But one of the good things is that we work with our church leaders. And working with them, we will be able to see what they will ask us to be involved with, uh, if at least just to give guidance and to provide resources so that there can be some healing for these traumatic experiences. We will pick that up as we are able to in terms of that uh, context. Um, how do we get respect for church, in church and in government? That again is a difficult one because I mean, you know, we have so much of diversities amongst us and it is different to, difficult to actually pick those things together in that sense of it. Um, you talked about the church being oppressed. You talked about uh, speaking certain things in terms of truth. The one thing that I do want to say is that we can speak as church and we will be respected as church when we are talking about issues of justice and reconciliation and so forth. But the one thing that we do need to understand is the need for inclusivity. That when we do speak, we need to be inclusive. 
We must not speak as Christians exclusively, fundamentalistically, condescendingly, as if we're the only ones who have a solution. We need to work with everybody else, and that's what it means to be ecumenical, is to work with other people, NGOs, stakeholders, as I said earlier, people of other faiths, and even at times with people with no faith, in order to create a better society for all. So inclusivity is important, and seeking respect in that context must also ensure that as Christians, when we call for certain things, we are not being disrespectful of others in the process. Um, the last were some comments of, on the chat, but I just want to say that one of the important things that the WCC works with and takes very seriously is the issue of policy formation. And we speak to governments. I can tell you stories of how um, my offices in Geneva and people working in there have actually worked in different parts of the world where their inputs has led to policy changes even in Islamic states. And, and that's a central aspect of our work. Because if you're working for justice and peace and reconciliation, then we need to ask what policies actually aid that possibility. And we work quite a bit on policy formation. Thank you. Once again, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, for the response to the questions. We are now going to have a choir performance um, by the Johannesburg Choristers, after which we're going to invite to the podium Bishop Malus Mpumlana just to do the closing remarks. And then later we'll have a closing prayer and benediction by Bishop Stembele Sibuka. So first our choir, after which we'll invite the, the two bishops
Hey, when I grow up, I'm going to join that choir. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it's very hard on an occasion such as this, uh, not only so rich in what it presents, but also rich in the quality of audience, uh, to know what the appropriate thing is to say. But I think we'll all agree that the first vote of thanks goes to Professor Jerry Pillay. Yeah. And I should like through him to thank his staff, the people we've been negotiating with. <laughs> uh, because I know that this was a very difficult call. Professor Pillay was due to attend and speak at COP28 in the Emirates. And to negotiate a change of his slot in order to accommodate this was no small feat. So thank you very much, Prof. <clears throat> Otherwise, he's on his way transiting here from Abuja in Nigeria, where he was attending the All Africa Conference of Churches, the Continental SACC, so to say. <laughs> I want to ch thank uh, Professor uh, Pulen Linkabula, the Vice Chancellor and Principal of this university. Um, not for the partnership we have with UNISA, but for making it possible for us. I know that was your office that enabled us to be in this room today. <laughs> and also on behalf of the Central Committee of the SACC for your generous accommodation of our other meetings which are happening at UNESA through tomorrow afternoon. Thank you so very much, ma'am. I know that uh, we were, um, somebody said, well, let's, let's talk to her. She's a former vice president of the SACC, she'll understand. I said, no, don't even mention that. That would be nepotism. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this wouldn't have been without this audience, both inside Horong and at home through the electronic systems. And I just want to say thank you very much for taking your time to be here. We appreciate it. We don't take it for granted. And one of the people that are at home um, send a note to say, um, I'm grateful that this is on YouTube because I've been rushing to make sure that uh, dinner is ready before load shedding. <laughs> um, but please, let's give ourselves a round of applause. It does not matter what Pile comes to say here. Without an audience, it's a waste of time. <laughs> Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Really do. I want to thank for Closer Foundation, particularly Father Lawrence and his team. They are actually the initiators of this idea. Um, we were simply the facilitators because of our familiarity with Professor Pillay's office. But actually, this is a for Closer request. And I should also say, if you don't mind, they paid for his travel here. So thank you very much. I want to thank the, all the teams that worked um, together to pull this together. They were in these meetings that were almost daily uh, between UNISA, this UNISA logistics team, the Forloza team and the SACC team. And Professor Pillay asked me a question. I said, I do not know the answer to that question. There are relevant people that have the answer. 
Uh, but thank you so much for all the hard work that brought us to where we are today, including the program and everything, right down to the T. And we are very grateful for that. I would like to also express a gratitude to um, the program director, even though there seemed to be a question of who's who. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that seamless collaboration that enabled us to get going, this we're grateful. We also have to thank, um, now I'm going to talk about those that are from the SACC that did a few things. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank um, uh, Professor Mudise, um, I recognize him as from us, even though Eunice might say something different about him, uh, because he is one of their faculty. But for us, he's the head of a, a member church, and so uh, that's us coming in here to make ourselves looking useful. Thank you very much, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I would like to thank also. Um, uh, Bishop Sipuka, who is going to close for us this evening. Um, now, we can re uh, reveal that we chose Bishop Sipuka uh, because we wanted to be nice to Father Lawrence, who is a Catholic <laughs> bishop. <laughs> and uh, I will thank my own president, um, Archbishop Tabo Makhoba. Uh, he's quite exhausted. Uh, they all have just come from Abuja, and they're quite tired, and it's getting late in the evening. But thank you very much, uh, Your Grace. <laughs> yeah, I will be remiss not to thank uh, Professor Pile's family members that are here. Please, uh, would we could have them to stand a little, please? Jay? Jay? There you are. <laughs> now, now that's uh, Professor Pile's twin brother and, and Professor Pile's daughter. Now, uh, I say, because their mother is still alive, I say, you know, it must be a great joy to have two, these twins of mine that are both professors. <laughs> How do, what kind of formula should you have for that? <laughs> um, but hey, can we thank the choir while it's seated? <laughs> I think that I think that those thanks will be much more, much more valid if they gave us just one sound before we have Bishop Sipuga say his prayer. Just one. I go! I go! He's not alone, dog! <laughs>
That sound is beautiful. It's mother's milk. Thank you. <laughs> In closing my remarks, I want to remind us that the approach that uh, Professor Pile took, uh, if you listen from the beginning to the end, is one that we call See Judge Act, where you analyze what you see. Then you apply your theology in interpreting it, and then talk about what action is appropriate. And since we've been challenged to action too, I would appeal that as we go away, we try not to use emotion, but analysis. Thank you. The reason why Bishop Mulana asked me to do the final prayer <laughs> is that I am a bishop in his hometown. <laughs> and since he eloped to Johannesburg, when I come here, I get to brief him about a pig that has died <laughs> or a cow that has got lost. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for disturbing us from our comfort zones and told us that uh, in those who are hungry, in those who are sick, in those who are exploited, you are actually those people. In the earth that is destroyed, it's actually your lovely creature and you have moved us to come here to listen together to the spirit that comes from you so that you can offer us inspiration to bring solution to those problems. Thank you, Lord, for being among us, for inspiring us through the reflections that we have had since this morning and particularly through this lecture. And Lord, now that we have heard, you have put a responsibility for us to act. Now we have heard and there is no excuse now why we should not act. And yet, Lord, not with our own power because we are mere human beings. And so we ask that as you have inspired us, empower us now to act, so that through us, this situation may change, and that through us, your kingdom may come. Protect us as we go back home. Inspire us tomorrow when we continue to listen to you together, to listen together to the Spirit about the way forward. Keep safe our own son here, whom you have called to serve the church at world level. We thank you, Lord, for his gift. We thank you, Lord, for his inspiration. May we not disappoint him by doing nothing. Give us the strength to act and to do what needs to be done. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Butlelane buka moya onxele nothando lukathixoyise mahlale nani ngoku nangona phakade amen Small announcement small announcement to central committee members I was told to do that Okay bishop forgot to do that We are grateful it looks like the rain has subsided the transport to go back to the hotel and sleep and everything else is at the Senate Hall. So we are asked members of the Senate Committee to please try and find our way to there so that then you can get to know the transport system and everything that accompanies with that. I'm hoping that the, with the rain subsiding, we can move fast then to go there. Thank you very much.
Yes. Can only the eye move so by your previous by your <laughs> Yeah, that is. Thank you. <laughs>